It is called The Personal Treasures of Bernard and Shirley Kinsey. The collection features rare pieces which until now have been tucked away in a private gallery. We are at the home of Bernard Shirley Kinsey to take a look at the Kinsey Collection. The Kinsey Collection pays homage to African Americans who helped build and transform the United States. Once scattered by history and now gathered in a single collection, a cultural inheritance for African Americans. Tonight a conversation about the intersection between art and history with Bernard and Shirley Kinsey documenting the African-American experience from the early 17th century through the tumultuous civil rights era, the Kinseys have had a 30-year love affair with collecting. The Kinsey collection started 30 plus years ago. We didn't, we didn't start out for this to be a collection, but we're delighted that it has happened that way because the more we began to understand and know about our history, the more we felt that other people needed to be touched and, and know about it too. Some of the items were passed down through their family, some were purchased at auctions, and others were acquired during the Kinsey's numerous trips around the world. We've been to 90 countries and six continents, and we basically collected something from all of these 90 countries. But our real focus has always been, how do we speak to the African Americans? Their collection isn't only African-American, but mostly paintings, sculpture, and documents from the distant past and the not-so-distant. I love this letter. A letter from Malcolm X to Alex Haley, 1963. Over the years, they realized they were collecting a story. When we came to the Americas from Africa, how do we evolve? And, and that evolution is, is, is both painful and wonderful. And, and putting that together is what we, we tried to do here. It's been quite a journey for a couple who met as college kids at predominantly black Florida A&M in 1963 when students were fighting for civil rights. I met her after she got out of jail. They've grown so close. Uh, demonstrating. Demonstrating. So, you know, you know, sit-ins. Sit -ins they finish each other's sentences. Yeah. So you knew she was something special from the oh, beginning. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Both now are retired from Xerox, where Bernard rose to become vice president. He's now a much-in-demand business consultant. Fast forward to the present. The couple holding a news conference in Washington, D.C., as their collection, the shared treasures of Bernard and Shirley Kenzie, now greets visitors to the busiest museum in all the world the Smithsonian. I have opened numerous exhibitions throughout my career, but few have excited, few have challenged, few have moved me as much as the Kinsey Collection. As the first African American ever to publish a book of poetry. This is my first time seeing the collection since I uh, did the recording for it. So it's kind of fantastic. It's a wonderful way to show that we too are part of the fabric of the making of this nation, which sometimes I think gets forgotten in the telling of the American stories. Efforts like this are efforts to fill that gap. This is really important for young people. Knowing who you are is the best grounding you can get. I am immeasurably proud of my, my parents. Um, Every day, I, I, you know, I learn something from them continually. Uh, I, I get to work with them, and I never, if you had asked me 10 years ago if I'd be working with my parents, there wouldn't have been a chance. Uh, but it, it's just, it's been remarkable to see their partnership. The Kinseys have reached a stage in their lives where they can afford to indulge their passions, one even greater than collecting, sharing. Together, they have raised more than $22 million for scholarships at historically black colleges. You know that black people have been a part of everything that's happened in the Americas almost from the beginning. And having that connection with the past and with history is what really creates this sense of strength inside of us and to know that we have this identity that, and this lineage that is so powerful. We think what we have is the beginning of this story about this wonderful, wonderful race called African-Americans that came out of a, a terrible situation. I want our people to be empowered by all the accomplishments. Yeah. 
all the things that we did in building this country. And as Bernard says, sometimes let everybody know we got dibs here. Yeah, yeah. Okay? And we didn't always come here as slaves. We came here as free people initially. We do with the Kenji family, the Kenji collection, we want to motivate you to do better, to do well. Okay, not just your kids, but you too. Okay? Not just to be activists, but all the things that we do as as as, as families, you know, to make our communities better. Starting with voting. Do you know in 1867, 65% of black people voted in this country? And by 1930, only 3% voted. In 1899, there were 2,000 African American politicians, judges, senators, doctors, and you see these, you know, in this room. And why did they go? Because we couldn't vote. So if you think you have but one responsibility outside of taking care of your family is to vote. And I don't care what these legislatures do in these state legislatures uh, around the country. If you get your butts out and vote, you follow me? Because it's the only change that you can affect. You see what happened in November? We got Biden. You see why we got Biden? It's because people voted, black people in particular, okay? We got two senators, not a senator. So everybody got a check for twelve hundred dollars or whatever it was, you know, in January, you know, after Biden was elected. That was because of black people voting in Georgia. You have a direct link with voting and your well-being, particularly being African American. And if you don't take care of that responsibility, shame on you. Okay. Now we have to say, I'm going to give you a lot of little, little nuggets, hopefully you take home. So this is one of them. Leave the door open and the ladder down. Let's everybody say that. Leave the door open. Let's give it a little Leave the door open. Keep that in your heart. Because if you do that, you'll find that every time you advance, you pull it. You advance it, you pull it. And that's the way out for us. Helping each other. We have a saying, if you see a turtle, on a pole, he had help. <laughs> and everybody in this room had help. None of us got to where we were going to get to because we're just smart. Everybody's smart. But the difference is somebody saw something in you and said, you know what? I'm going to give you a little, I'm gonna give you a little, little pull, a little push. That's what we want to do. Every one of us has been warmed by fires we did not build a drunk from wells that we did not dig or from trees that we did not plant. Got it? We're all part of this big community. Alright, stop it right there. Just tell the whole thing. Okay. Here's what we try to do as a family. Shirley, Bernard, uh, and Khalil. We strive to give our ancestors a voice, a personality, a name, enabling the viewers, you, to understand the challenges, obstacles, triumphs, accomplishments, and extraordinary sacrifice of African Americans to build this country. Isn't that what the toast is? That's what this place here is doing right here. To try and put this story of accomplishment and achievement, you know what I mean, in Tulsa, in people's minds and hearts. Derek, Heather, hey, let's give Heather and Derek a big round of applause. Heather is
And this defines who's a citizen, who votes, who goes to jail, who works, who gets health care, who has wealth, and who lives in together. Okay? And it's true, right? Because when people talk about voters right now, nobody talking about white people's voters right now. Just 
participated in the American dream for all 400 years. We know what happened. All of the suppression, all the things that have created to keep black people from going, not being able to get a farm loan from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the farm or not being able to live in certain areas and get redlined so you can't get insurance and all these things. And all of this has contributed to this piece. And these are local issues that only local people can solve. That's why I'm going with Tulsa. And I'm not just on Tulsa, because we say this in every city we go to. Okay? We went to Mississippi State. I've been, we've been there all over. Okay? I even talked to the Chinese about it. Okay? <laughs> in Hong Kong, in Shanghai. We spoke in Shanghai and Beijing. Same thing. They just had to travel. Okay? We're dead serious about it. And you don't get dead serious about it, shame on you. Because you cannot affect change unless you get you, you connect with your heart and your head about change. Okay? Excellent. All right. Here's a clear example. 97.6% of employment of white people that have uh, college education are employed. The same person with a a black person with a college education is only 92.8% employed. And then a white male with some college education is 92.5%. Now, there are two ways to look at this stuff. Let me give you the bottoms up. If you're a white person with a, you know, one year college, you basically work the same way that a black person works with a college degree. That's what that's saying. There's only three tenths difference between the two having a college education and not having a college education if you're white or black. And that's the reason why most black people try to get a master's degree. Because you know inherently, I got an MBA in 1973. I knew inherently, but I said, in this country, the only way I can make the same money a white person with a college education, I got to get a master's. Right? That's what you do, right? You go get a master's, PhD, and you, you hope that you can work up your life. But that's the statistic there that says everything about America. Okay? That even with a college education, we are three-tenths better than someone without a college education if they're white. That's the difference between prejudice, power, and privilege. And here's what we say about privilege. Privilege is like being born on third base and thinking you hit a triple. <laughs> That's what white people have. Because they really think that they earned all this. But in fact, they got a head start. I mean, I think about all the farmers in the country. Yeah, hundreds of acres, and they're proud of seven generations. And I said, well, what happened to the three million acres that black people owned in 1870? <coughs> you know what I mean? Three million acres we owned in 1870. It was taken. That's right. Just like here in Tulsa, in Wilmington, and all these other parts of the country. And we have an opportunity now from a political standpoint to begin to hopefully over the next four years and beyond because we're going to vote again, right? Okay? To be able to keep this continuity so we can make it make some, some change. Okay, honey. In 1970, there were 300,000 people in jail. Today, 2015, we have 2.3 million people in jail. Next slide. Now, this is the one I want to consider. There have been 70 million arrests of black people in this country, resulting in 6 million black people being on probation. So you got 2.3 million, what? In jail. And you got another 6 million on probation, which means you can't vote, you can't get a job. You got that. And I mean, I, I, I'm not going to show you all the other stuff. But in every city, including Tulsa, the police department, because they sit in black communities, give tickets at a rate three to four times they give tickets anywhere else. So I tell white people, y'all don't worry about speeding because they know black, they know cops over there. Because <laughs> they're all in our community. Now, people say, well, your community is more dangerous. I don't believe that. I do not believe that. But I believe we have an occupying force in many of our communities with a badge and the ability to almost do anything they want to do to it. And until we change that relationship, we're not going to have it. And, and I speak from experience. 
I advise the LAPD, the LA Sheriff, and the Inglewood Police Departments in LA. I know this culture really well. Okay? And now, 99.1% of the people are good people. But I tell you, you've got 18 million, I mean, you've got 18,000 police departments in America. Just do the math on that. Okay? All right, next one. Okay, and I'm going to leave on this side. We think that Tulsa was really maybe the only place. But look at look at the race. And, and let's stop talking about it. Because when you say race, you say black people doing something. Leave the white people doing something to black people. Okay? With impunity. And in every case, it was because black people were beginning to have some agency. So Tulsa is in no way an outlier, as bad as Tulsa is. This is pretty incredible, isn't it? It was called the Red Summer. You tell me the Red Summer. You ever heard of the Red Church? The Red Church were like the Ku Klux Klan. Okay? Ku Klux Klan started in Biloxi, Tennessee, in 1866. It started out as a fraternal club and turned into the white knights of the Mississippi. Probably terrorizing black people because they found that if they can terrorize people, they won't vote. If you don't vote, then we can own the city. We can put up all these monuments to Confederate soldiers, to white supremacists, and nobody thinks about it. And it's your tax dollars. Think about it. And then you gotta fight to get them to take this stuff down of people that you know what they did to your ancestors. And that's where you got to start here in Tulsa, too. You got to be willing to take these dog on uh, uh, Confederate and white supremacy uh, sculpture down. Yes, you can quote me on that. Okay? Because California got more of them than I realized. And we're on top of California with it. And it was a free state they keep. So what we have to do, we have to open our eyes. Shirley will tell you, if we go into a store and we don't see black people working there, we are less able to I may, I don't want to uh, shop there. You've got to begin to remove your dollars if you're serious about this, this process. You follow me? You just can't just go and keep giving your money away. The reason Tulsa was so successful like Wall Street because of dollars are free. And the reason we don't have it, you know, we say the reason that white people uh, have money and we don't because white people spend money with white people and black people spend money with white people. Now that's a pretty bad combination. Okay? So if we want to switch that, we got it. And when we do that, those dollars circulate in a way that create jobs. And when we create jobs, you don't have to worry about people hitting you in the head because they don't have a need to hit you in the head. Okay? You know this. Next slide. Okay. All right, I'm going to just do a couple of things. Okay. How are, we, are we doing okay? Are we doing okay? All right. But, uh, you know, now this is the average. You know, when you say, are we doing okay, you're supposed to get call and response. I mean, are we doing okay? Yeah. 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 Yes. Y'all sit there like, you know, the Europeans sit there, you know. <laughs> All right, all right. The road to success is under construction, and the road to failure is a four lane highway. Okay, listen to that. The road to success is under construction, and the road to failure is a four lane highway. And this is for all of us, all age groups. What we have to be careful about is how easy it is in this country to get in trouble. And I tell the young people this all the time. Navigating this thing called America because we have so many laws and so much policing in our communities that it almost just going back and forth to work or to the store can be hazardous to you. And when Khalil was growing up, we just, we were always, we couldn't sleep until he got home at night. Now, why is that? You worried about your son because the, the gangs in the neighborhood get him or the shit we call it. The LAPD gang or the sheriff gang or the 
Crips and the Bloods. I mean, they, all of them operate. Right? The same thing here. Okay? We have to work this out. And we can only work it out when we get involved with the PTA. Okay? Make sure our schools are right. When we get our schools right, we get our kids right. When we get our kids right, we get them on the right trajectory so that they can have the right kind of, kind of life. Okay? We got to get involved with these police unions and have our voices heard in there. The city council, with the mayor. What are we doing about our survivors? We raised $30 million. I couldn't believe it. We raised $30 million. We couldn't, what, what did we say? We couldn't break off a little bit of that for the survivors. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on, think about it. We can bring John Lennon into town, but we can't, we can't even, we can't, we, we can't give something to people that we know lost everything. That should hurt your heart in a way that's really difficult, okay? Okay, so I'm going to close it here. Uh, and uh, Well, thank you, Shirley. The myth of absence. The myth of absence says that we as black people are invisibly present. Say that. Nothing is plenty for me. 
okay, that came off the slave ship. And just think about how magnificent our people are to be able to go on these passages and still come here with this wonderful expression of resistance and expectancy. Those are the two words that I want you to take out today because those are the two words that still operates today in America for every black person in this country. Let's say resistance. <laughs> Let's say expectancy. <laughs> those two words work the same way. And it's the conflict that each of us have as family members. Resist, resist this, this racism in this country in every shape, form, or fashion. But then you got to turn around and be a father, a mother. You follow me? Okay. And it's this part that just keeps you all tied up. You know, I, I always say this. Black men ought to get Social Security at 55. <laughs> you know what? Because we don't ever get it at 7. Because we're dead. You follow me? And it's a lot of that is because the stress that most black men go through every day. Just by waking up every day. And what we have to do is either release the stress or go to it and get rid of it. Okay? Now what I learned and a lot of us have learned is how to incorporate it and still have a life. That's what resistance and expectancy is all about. Okay? Right. One more. Shirley. I told you her. <laughs> Just tell me. <laughs> yeah, because I want them to see this. Yeah. This is Thomas Parks in 1808. Just hit the play button. No, nope, go back and, and tell them to go back. And this actually is a video inside of it. I want to apologize. There's nothing to apologize. They ain't talking to me. <laughs> All right. Now, just hit the, the, it's a play button. Or just hit the, the, the enter or whatever they do and get it to play. <coughs> Y'all just bear with us. Now, we're going backwards. We're going to go forwards. Going backwards, we may, may not be able to see it. But let me say this: 1808, Thomas Parks. Here's what we've done with the kids' collection. We've collected 700 pieces started in 1595. We have documented this story meticulously in every form that you have. We have a book of 1,600 names by Leo Africa Collins. Let me tell you what the book says. The book says it talks about Africa before it becomes denuded by slavery. So in other words, we start that Africa is not a dark time. It's very alive. Matter of fact, Africa, when, when Europe was in the Middle Ages being traveled, black people were teaching astronomy and math and all of the, the sciences in Africa. So we know that we come from a great place, but we let people kind of sit that into our heads. And think about this. How are you going to take 12 to 15 million black people from a place and not have that effect. We are from Africa. And all of our genes came from Africa. And we, and that's why Africans today are having problems with governance. Because we're here. You follow me? Not that. Right? Makes sense? So all of this is operating in, you know, every day. Hit the next one, honey. Okay, this is from 1850. Next one, this is a, 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 a young girl's chapel that we look at. This is Estebana, if, if, if it will show. Oh, what's going on? I mean, okay. This is the actual document of the young sister from St. Augustine, uh, Esteban. Next one. That's in the first, first uh, gallery. Okay, hold it there. Not only do we have a marriage certificate 
1598, but we know the names of the people on it. You follow me? We know who the witnesses were when they got married in 1598. Do not let anybody tell you that we came here in 1619 to enslave you. Now, I know that's the story. We win Pulitzer for it. But it is just not the whole story. You follow me? The 1595 document is the oldest known document of the African American existence in this United States. Period. Close quote. Okay? These documents. Okay? Next one. This is Leo Africanus, written by an African, a body African before the Congress was destined. Now we have two of these. We have one in 1632, which is in that room. We have one in English in 1600. Next one. I love this stuff. Letters of the late Ignatius Sancho. He is a brother that was born on the slave ship. I don't want anyone in this room or not in this room to tell me they can't graduate from high school. This brother was born on a slave ship and goes on to become an opera singer, a big businessman. He was the first person of African descent to vote in an election in uh, England. Got it? That's it. FBR, I love this brother. 1789, we have two of them. 1789 and uh, 1794. Here's a brother. He and his sister were kidnapped, right? Mercantilism, okay. Kidnapped and brought to the United States. He bought me at nine years old. He's the son of a king. He goes to the Caribbean, and this English captain recognizes that the kid was smart. Why? Because he's a Muslim. Muslim speaks the Quran. Guess what? 30% of the people that came from Africa and came to America, we are 30% Muslim. Almost all of our shopkeepers, all of our intellectuals, I have Muslim descent. Why? Because we could read. Even when white people didn't want us to read, we could read because we could read the Quran. I'm just trying to get this in your head because some of this stuff, I know it sometimes. Okay? Okay. So in the Caribbean, he gets bought by this English captain. And because he's smart, I tell people being smart is a pretty good deal. Okay? <coughs> Teach them how to sail. So the brother. Not only learns how to sail, at some point he becomes his own captain and, and sails the six continents. He comes back to England and he, Thomas Clarkson, the other book, William Penn, the British Prime Minister, and William Wilberforce, they begin to have the audacity to change slavery in England. And for 30 years, they used his book, Thomas Clarkson's book, Ignatius Sancho's book to change the narrative in England, and England abolishes slavery in 1808. Long before America gave it. You know, America had the opportunity, you know, they could cut a deal with the South and say, you know what? I'll let you keep your enslaved people to 1900 if you're staying in England. You know what these Southerners said? <coughs> we wanted in perpetuity. You know what perpetuity means? Forever. You understand what perpetuity means? Yeah. This is in, I take slavery, white supremacy, is in the DNA of this country. It's this whole white identity. Okay? Well, the last time I looked, this country has changed at a rate that that cannot ever happen anymore. Okay? And I don't think that's bad for America. I think that is absolutely good for America. To have this balance. Okay. Thank you. I'm working surely too hard. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love this document. Remember we talked about it from Argentina to Canada? This is from Peru in 1604. During the Inquisition when Pizarro was there. Okay? Now read up there. You see Negro, Malado. I'm a Malado. Okay? Uh, Batisto does the Indians, probably Native, Native Americans, a Native uh, Peru. So this document in 1604 is talking about black folks. Why? Because we were there. Matter of fact, Peru in the 15th century had more black people than Peruvians. Coast And the 
the same thing happened there that happened in Argentina, that happened in Colombia, that happened in Brazil, the lightning process. Cuba did it really well. You follow me? It's a lightning process. You follow me? You bring in more Europeans, they have more babies, and the population lightens over generations. And then you denigrate your black population to a point that they have no agency. You follow me? Push them out to the, the corners of, 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 of your country. Okay? It happened in every Central American country, every South American country. Okay? And Mexico. Next one. Now, that's why you got to come to Tacoma, because this story, I mean, this is, this is a big story. Mexican slave trade, 1790. This is Jose Montana. He has a name. He was being sold for 60 pesos. The second president of Mexico is a brother named Vicente Guerrero. We just purchased his inaugural address April 29th, 1829. Yeah, the Okay? Hey, check this out. He gets in office, and one of the first things he does is abolish slavery in, in, in Mexico. That's why he got a bomb. He's a brother in Mexico. Bobby? How many of you been on Pico Boulevard in LA? If you've been on Pico, that's the thing that's your brother. Because he was the governor of California when it was it belonged to Mexico. Yeah, just you know what? For the 44 people that founded Los Angeles in 1791, 26 of them were black Negroes. Mm -hmm. They spoke Spanish. Because see, Spanish speaking people don't think black people just speak Spanish. Which is ridiculous. Because 15% of all people on the Atlantic seaboard, they speak Spanish instead of black. That's that racism even among the Latin group. You follow me? We have to deal with that too. Okay? Next one. That was Mexico before uh, 1848. It owned all the way up to Oregon, California, New Mexico, most of Texas. So forth and so on. Next one. Tens of millions of acres were taken. Oh, here's a brother, Vincente. What did he look like? <laughs> okay. You can't mistake that, right? I ain't making this stuff up. Come on. Oh, that's Pico there. Okay? After the end of this and here's the business, the founders of Los Angeles. Sure, go back, right quick. I'm showing you this stuff is because if you get the composite of all of it, it changes your story. You, I mean, you know, we have a saying, you get trapped by the truth. Okay? You get trapped by the truth because when you see documents that, I mean, it's, you just can't make this stuff up. It's like going and seeing what happened here in Tulsa? You just can't make this up. But look at this. The founder of the law said, Negro, clothes, 26. Spoke Spanish. So you know what I tell my Latino brothers in LA? I said, you got dibs <laughs> I don't have to walk in this room backwards, you know, because we don't have a, a large population. And we have to stop that. That we don't think we belong. And I know a lot of black people feel that way. Who give the dog on? It's your agency that's important. That's why. You saw found in Chicago. Okay? The Indian said the first white man I saw was a brother. The name was <laughs> <laughs> When all they had to do was raise their hand and fight with it, the English they had been free the first day. So 5,000 black people decided that the ideals of America were important enough to walk away from freedom with the English. 
and fought with George Washington. Next one. Next one. I wish I had two. <laughs> This is Deja Butler. She is really doing really well. She does quilts and cotton applique. And what we love with the Kinsey Collection is taking an art item and, and, and using it from a historical standpoint. So here's a sister of uh, Deja Butler who's very much alive and very much sought after with a, uh, a piece, you know, in applique that represents the cotton production. In 1857, Charles Tiffany sent his son a check for $500 from Montgomery, Alabama. His son took the check and opened the store on Broadway. The store is named Tiffany. You don't think we own some of Tiffany? <laughs> think about it. If $500 came out of 1857 with Montgomery Cotton, that black people produce got nothing for it and open up a place called Tiffany that's in business now? You don't think we have a piece of that? That's how you got to start thinking. Okay? And that's the lineage in everything in America. All of this labor, all of this genius that we produce and we got nothing for it. Next one. This is so <laughs> All right. All right. 1798. Hold up. Now they're going too fast. Right. This document here, I think, is one of the most important documents in the American canon. It's the Three Fifth Compromise. If you go the rest of your life, you probably never, never see a document that really speaks to the Three Fifth Compromise. But what it says is, yeah, this is New York in 1801. In 1797, the Continental Congress cut a deal with the South and said, well, we know you're smaller, but we'll make you larger by you count your enslaved people. So that's what they did. So enslaved people were now being counted to, to bring up the South influence and companies. What this resulted in, that the South became, had more presidents, more Supreme Court justices, and Congressman. And that's true even today. Anytime you look at the filibuster, the filibuster came out in 1787, coming up. You know what I mean? All that was about slavery. Almost everything about America is about slavery, whether we know it or not. We've only had two presidents elected without the uh, popular vote. George Bush and Donald Trump. So think about it. Because of this document, we got the Continental Congress, we got the Electoral College. And electoral college now is to equalize small states with large states. That's what it is. The small states were in the south, the large states were in the north. So now we have two presidents in there that didn't win the popular vote. Okay? And we just went for four years of what that means. <laughs> that we didn't vote because, well, Hillary was this. I hate being black. Like, I don't know if she's honest. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Come on. We just have to get, I mean, we gotta get real. We gotta get real. Next one. How we doing? Yeah. All right, you all right? All right, all right. I'm trying to give you all of it right here because when we get on this train, I'm not sure when I'm gonna be back. Yeah. <laughs> we got a lot of other cities we're going to. All right. I love this little girl, 1850. We have so many beautiful images of black people doing slavery that uh, we, just, we just love. But check this, this uh, Arbor Ball insurance company. We have, I, I heard that black people were insured, but I didn't believe it until I saw it, okay? So the only way you get in the Kinsey Collection, we have to document it. You don't get in here because somebody wrote an article. You know, yeah, I don't believe in that. If it ain't real, I don't own it. I don't care what you say, you know what I mean? Because everything in here, we back it up. So we don't have to have an opinion. When you get the book, just read it. Just read it. It'll jump off the page at you. You follow me? That's what real history is about. It's not his story. It's history. OK? All right, next one. Houston Slave Bill and Houston Slave Act of 1793 is what
what 18,000 police departments are operating on today. This document here deputized white citizens to be able to go out and take black people and put them in slavery. Okay? Mm -hmm. And George Washington signed the, seventh, the first 1793 bill, Future Slave Bill. Okay? Next one. Shirley, stop talking. Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta give me somebody else on this job. <laughs> uh, yeah, we gotta get somebody else on this job. Come on back up here and get somebody else on this All right, this is a great book. Uh, how many of you heard of Soda Book 12 Years of Slavery? Well, this is the first edition book on 1853. Okay? So here's a brother from Saratoga. We know the story, right? But let me give you another story. So here's a brother. I'm making a little money. He said, well, yeah, I'll take a gig down to the south. That's what D.C. was, you know, the south. You know that means they take you. <laughs> so what I said, he got too humble. Now, he stayed in Saratoga. He'd been all right. But he went to D.C. and he got boom. He goes 12 years. Now, what the practice was this. The practice was the, the north of um, um, the, the, the uh, the northern south and the southern south. So what they would do is take black people from D.C., Virginia, North Carolina, all of that, and move them all the way down, you know, as far away from, you know, the, the agency laws which gave them freedom. And that's what Solomon worked on for 12 years, trying to get somebody to believe that he was, in fact, free. It's a pretty amazing story, but it happened all the time. Next one. Shirley? <laughs> you see, I don't have any of these. <laughs> All right, Frederick Douglass. Um, this piece is at Gavin's place. I love this piece. Um, <coughs> now she's no longer with him, but a beautiful sister. But Frederick Douglass, 1839, bought his freedom. No, he didn't buy it. I'm sorry, he, did, he escaped from it. You know, he had an abusive master. He was going to kill the master or he left me. And he became the great orator that we all know about. And he also was the guy that told Lincoln, you better hire these brothers and give them some guns and put them with the Union soldiers because you're losing the war. Right? Now think about it. In 1863, we had Gettysburg. Where is Gettysburg? Gettysburg is in Pennsylvania, which means the North was already losing this war. So, Charlie, please.
So you travel all around the country, so and all around the world. What is the message that you have for young social justice activists that are out here who are trying to make things happen? You know, and they're getting frustrated with things that are not happening fast enough. That this is a long arc, the, lo the uh, long arc of justice. Is, is long, but it bends toward justice, okay? In other words, we just gotta keep at it. We are fighting a, a pernicious war of, of, of white supremacy, of not telling our history, of voter suppression, all the things that we've been fighting from slavery, we're still fighting. So we just have to, we have to, I, the, the saying I always have is leave the door open and the ladder down. We gotta keep looking forward and reaching back. And, and, and uh, I'm a lot older than you are, and I'm still fighting. And I, so, and you know, my comment in, in, in my talk was, there are two things that all black people have to have, resist and expect. In other words, we gotta continue to resist this racism, but we gotta expect better out of America. Well, you see things changing, such as Juneteenth holiday. Um, what, what is your thoughts on that? Well, I think as we progress, we take small steps each time, and this is another step toward that. The biggest step we got to make still is changing the, the makeup of these state legislatures, city council legislatures all over the country. And, you know, with the midterms, keep, keep the House and the Senate in Democratic hands. Because it makes a direct difference in what black people get in terms of income and, and, and policies and all of that. So, I mean, anybody, particularly black, that don't see a direct correlation between voting and what they got here in the last few months, they living on another planet. Yeah, and I, and I, and I noticed that. I mean, we have, this, we have this mindset a lot of times, we, even within our own people, that voting doesn't work. But that's not the truth. I mean, we, we're able to stand here today because of on the backs of other people. Can you speak a little bit about why that's so significant for those who doubt those things? Well, I mean, when black people voted in the 1870s, 1860s, we had over 2,000 black elected officials in the South. By 1899, we basically had none. And we went almost 100 years in some places without another black politician. Josiah Walls from Florida, my home uh, state, was elected in 1876. We didn't have another black person elected until 1993. So over 100 years, because of voter suppression, we were not able to do it. So I think this is just, it's just a battle. But we have more to lose than anybody else, so that means I don't give a dog on what white people do as it votes to voter suppression. We have still got to vote because white people still got to do those same things that they're telling us to do, okay? And look at what happened in Georgia. A lot of white people didn't vote, right? So this pendulum can swing if we continue to fight for the things that we have agency over, and that's what I'm just voting. What, is, what, what, what do you think white people are so afraid of? I think it's in the DNA. You think so? I really do think it's in the DNA. I mean, the white identity in this country is really massively deep, okay? And there are some good white folks, but the average white person really believes that they're superior to, you know, uh, black people. And they've been taught that from childhood. I think it comes in, I think it's genetic now, okay? Because you can see how easily we revert back to 100 years ago. I mean, how could you have the kind of uh, election in November where all of the southern states validated those elections and then they turn around within two months and invalidate them and start making up stories about uh, voter fraud? I, so I think it's very deep. And unless we get control of these legislatures, be in the room in other words, I think it's gonna continue. Because I always say you gotta shine a light on this darkness. I mean, roaches don't like light, <laughs> okay? And that's what we had to do with the roaches. Right. We had to shine a light on them, because they hide. And that's the only place they can stay, you know, when they hide. But, but they're dangerous when they come out, okay? And I think to a large degree, 
you know, we see these legislatures passing this stuff right here in Oklahoma. A governor that says that we're going to teach about Tulsa, and then the next thing you know, we're talking about we're not going to do it in race theory. Yeah, and, I, and that's, that's in my next question leading into that, is that you see this suppression nationally of teaching. We, we finally are getting some truth mm -hmm. to our children, and now they're coming in saying, nope, we don't want this to happen. Well, we, we have to stop worrying. See, I'm like this. Let's stop thinking about what black, white people are thinking about us. Who gives a doggone? What we have to do is to think about what we want to do about our families, okay? And support the Greenwood Cultural Center, support the institutions that are doing the things in our community that will help our community. In other words, what we're doing as a family is just one family. There are a lot of families trying to make a difference in this country, okay? And that's where we have to come out. And we, this ain't it awful thing is something that I just don't believe in, this apathy. That's one of the biggest issues we got in the country. Well, my vote don't count. Come on, man. Come on, man. Yeah, it, that, it's like that's what they want you to believe. Well, a lot of people swallow that pill, black folks. Yeah, but we have. Yeah, yeah we I, swallow that pill. I, I, I sit down and speak with young black people all the time. It's like, don't be ignorant. Why would you listen to them and not listen to what's actually working? But I agree with I mean, you. anybody that didn't vote for Hillary Clinton, you know, and stayed home voted for Trump. And you see what we got with Trump. Absolutely. Okay? So your vote matters. Mm -hmm. And if you don't vote, it still matters. Yeah. Because what you did is basically acquiesced on the truth. Absolutely. So you know? next you're going to be in Tacoma? Yes, sir. Jul okay. July 30th to August 1st. Uh, we're going to have like 6,000 square feet. I mean, it's going to be a huge July show. July 30th through August 1st. August 1st. It's going to be a huge show. Okay. Uh, we're going to start in 1595. We're going to pull out all the big guns. It's going to be a lot of fun.